Hey, it's Tim, Pickup Truck Plus SUV Talk. This is your first time on the channel? Welcome. On this channel, you'll find cool truck and SUV news, reviews, and interesting interviews like this one. You hit subscribe, click the bell, and smash the like button. We're talking trucks. In this case, I'm talking consumer reports about their trucks. Yeah, I'm joined by my friend Mike Quincy. He's one of the testers over at Consumer Reports, been there for a long time. In this interview, we're going to discuss with him how he gets his trucks, how he tests them, how he tows with them, how he goes off road with them. And there'll be some interesting stuff kind of behind the scenes, differences between how Mike does his job and how I do my job. And kind of some back and forth that we have. So I think it was a really interesting interview. I thought you guys would appreciate it. On this channel, I reference Consumer Reports here and there in different videos. And I think it's one of the top resources to look at when you're evaluating and you want to buy a new truck. You know, you need to use a variety of sources. And I think Consumer Reports is one of those top sources to make sure you look at. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get to the interview right now. Hey, I'm joined by my friend Mike Quincy, all the way from Connecticut, and uh, he is with Consumer Reports. Mike, how long have you been with Consumer Reports? I actually started with Consumer Reports way back in 1993 in the home office in Yonkers, New York, where I, I, I started working on the magazine and the, uh, the car buying guides, and uh, eventually you know, morphed into uh, digital publishing, which uh, admittedly this very old school publication was very reluctant to embrace. Uh, and then I started working full time at the track in Connecticut in 2001. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a good long haul. And I think uh, one of the reasons I told, said in the intro I want to do this video is that Mike and I have similar but different jobs. So Mike and I both review vehicles, but we do it in different ways. So you guys get vehicles like I get delivered to my house, but you have a whole different process. Right, right. We, we buy about uh, 50 vehicles a year, spend about $2 million uh, because we want to make sure that everything that we test is a normal sample of the kinds of vehicles that everyone else buys. And this isn't to knock the press fleet that, that, that you guys get and other, the main, other mainstream car books get. Um, but we want to make sure that it's exactly a, a sample that, that – everyone else buys. We, we, we contact the dealers anonymously. I have a non-consumer reports email that I use. And, and when I get an assignment to buy a car, I'm, I'm given a, a, what trim line to get, what options to get and things like that. And, and I, I, so I use my non-work email and contact a few dealers. And when the, when the vehicles start trickling in and, uh, then we, you know, go, negotiate the price just like anybody else. And then the day that I take delivery is when I tell them, by the way, I'm from Consumer Reports. Don't freak out. We're not we're not judging you or your dealer or anything like that. Uh, but this is going to be a test car. And honestly, about 95 percent of the time, the salespeople are like, oh, cool. Oh, I know Consumer Reports or or, you know, and, and things like that. And then when I get to the dealer, uh, undoubtedly, a bunch of the salespeople, the general manager, they all have questions like, oh, you know, because because we usually buy you know cars close close to our we usually buy cars in Connecticut. So, so it's very likely that the people that work at the dealership knew that the Consumer Reports test track used to be a drag strip way back in the day. And so they'll say, oh, you know, I raced my car there or my father raced a car there. And, and so there's, there's always questions that, 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 that come along with when someone comes to a dealer to buy a new car. So, and that's a very cool story. I'm just curious, how do you decide what trim level and options to look for? Well, we talk to the manufacturers and we want to get their take on what is uh, the, 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 the trim line that they anticipate most people buying. I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of cars and trucks these days, you know, you'll have, you'll have like an L version, an XL version and an EXL version or whatever. And, and it, it's usually some mid trim, uh, uh, midline mid trim that, that people are buying. And we look at the option packages and we try to conf, you know, also figure out what, what packages are people mostly like to buy. But sometimes we'll, we'll get an option that, that's, that's new. I mean, before a lot of the um, safety equipment has become so mainstream, it, they were option. I mean, there's a time when anti-lock brakes was new and exotic and an option. So, so we would often buy a trim line just to get ABS to try it out. Sure. So we also use that as part of our decision-making process. Yeah, it's interesting because I've gotten feedback on my channel because I always get the most luxury version of the trucks. And so I've been going to dealers getting different lower trim levels. So I mean, I totally respect what you do because I think that is really the way to review vehicles. And it's just the byproduct of press fleets is how, that's how they order and that's how the press fleet works. 
But so yeah, let's... I, I, saw, I saw that video that, that you said, you know, I'm, I'm usually always given like the highest trim line. And, and it's obviously it, it will help you, the journalist, to be kind of wowed by it. I mean, if you have if, if you're if you're just reviewing a, a like a pretty low level Ford F-150, well, you're going to say, well, it's a good truck and it can do this and that and the other right, thing. Right. But if you're in the, the King Ranch then you're like, look at this leather, look at this wood, look at all, it's heated, cooled seats, heated steering wheel, this thing is awesome. It's kind of like a luxury car, it's not even a truck. So I mean, I, I get why they do that. I mean, they definitely, they wanna dazzle the journalists with a nice trim line and, and you know, full disclosure, when, when Consumer Reports meets with manufacturers and we hear about their upcoming product lines and we'll often rent a vehicle from them kind of out of the press fleet, the same kind of stuff that you guys get, uh, to give it a try before they go on sale. And we'll drive it and we'll kind of get an idea of where it might fit into a test program with, with other models, where it might fit in, in our ratings. So you know, we, we totally understand where, where the manufacturers are coming from. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting thing. So you, know, you referenced that video and I can put a link to it on the screen here. Is I did, I went and got a, a base level, highest volume seller here in the dealership. And it was it's it's interesting to to take to peel off all those features, and to see it for what it is. It's like um, it's like a supermodel without makeup. You're like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> it's, it's like, but I, you know, it's it's interesting because the things I liked about it still were the still things I liked about the bigger versions. It's funny how that works, and I think that a lot of journalists don't get that when they first start out. Is you get these big wow things. You get these. Uh, I know we've talked to the, uh, not to ramble too much off, but we talked about press trips and things where you know we get catered to and that kind of stuff. And it's easy to get uh, blindsided by that a little bit when you first start off. And, and you know, the more experienced you get, and the more you've been experienced probably testing vehicles, the more dialed in you get on certain things, the more you, you realize certain things. Because, I mean, since 2001, a test track, that's 19 years testing vehicles your track. So, I, you know, after a while, I don't know about you, but after a while, if I'm getting in a 17 F-150, an 18 F-150, a 19 F-150, and a 20 F-150, uh, I'm not so wild by the same features I was maybe in 17. Right, but but also on the other hand, um, I'm also certain. I don't appalled isn't the right word, but when when you have say a twenty five thousand dollar Hyundai that has like you know heated seats and satellite radio and all these features for a relatively low price, and then you test like a fifty thousand dollar let's just say German manufacturer vehicle where heated seats, it's not even part of the 50 grand. You have to pay extra to get, I mean, so stuff like that makes my, makes the red flag come up for me. It's like, holy cow. I mean, what kind of value are, are consumers facing with these situations? Yeah, it, it is very interesting. And we come across that quite a bit. So let's, let's talk about this test track. You have, um, I'm looking behind you, you have like a mechanics workspace. I've always been curious. When you get these vehicles, how much do you inspect? Do you put them on lifts? Do you take off tires? Do you look at the brakes? How, how, how detailed do you get? Oh, everything. When, when, when we buy a, a test car, the first thing we do is bring it into our shop where our, our mechanics and our shop guys go over the car. We want to make sure that everything is up to spec. So we're going to check the tire pressure. We're going to check the torque on the lug nuts. We're going to make sure the car is in line. We're going to make sure that everything is functioning exactly the way the manufacturer designed it to. Because that way, when we go to start testing it, we want to make sure everything is running right. If we start testing a vehicle and something is way off and the, and the test results are off and the manufacturer gets upset at us and they come and they look at the car and they say, well, of course it didn't do well. This you know, thingamajig was broken or whatever. So we want to make sure that, that, the, that the vehicle is running and operating perfectly. And then we put it out on the road and all of us drive it. We all take turns driving car, the, the cars every, different, every night we, we, we swap out different cars. We put about 2,000 miles on the car, and then we kind of take it off the road, bring it back in the shop, check it back in, again, make sure everything is up to snuff, and then we start our instrumented testing. So 2,000 miles allows you know the transmission, the engine to kind of like break in. I don't know if they use the term break in anymore, but you know, you're burnishing the brakes, you're, making, you're taking the edge off the tires, uh, so, so you're making sure that, that, it, that it's kind of ready to be tested. Sure. And how many, you say a group of you guys drive it, how many is there of reviewing the cars in like your, your group? The, the core car reviewers, I would say, encompasses uh, about 15 people and, and probably another another 10 people work at the track, either a supporting role or, or taking care of the facilities and stuff like that. Do you think that that helps you avoid that uh, phenomenon called groupthink where the group starts thinking on the same way, having this bigger group of people? 
Oh, you know, see, we've never done this, but I always thought it would be a great video idea to have cameras around the table when we're having ratings meeting. Because every month we do a, just a, a new group of cars. And sometimes we get into some serious arguments. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a jury. I mean, there's a bunch of people that are scoring these cars. So there can't be one rogue person that goes off and just suddenly says, oh, my gosh, this is the greatest car ever or this is the worst car ever. You have other people that are going to kind of temper any kind of, of, of notion okay. that somebody is about to take over a ratings. And, and it's, a, it's a numerical score. So, you, you know, you're writing down, you know, scores. Handling is a is a four point whatever. I mean, we go to those decimal points and. Um, and, and, and then it comes out, you, know, you, 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 turn the, you turn the crank and it, and it gets a number for, for an overall score. And we also combine that with owner satisfaction and reliability, and that's the big, the big score. But, but so, so it isn't just one person deciding, this month, we like Volkswagens. Next month, we like Chrysler. I mean, it, does, it just doesn't happen that way. Sure, and, and I've been curious, you do a lot of scientific testing and a uh, bunch of numerals, but how do you score like passion? How do you score like enjoyment to drive? That's a great question and something I think admittedly as an organization we've, we've probably struggled with. I mean I've often thought that, that from a technical standpoint, Consumer Reports does an incredible job evaluating vehicles. But what we've always lacked is, is putting out that, the color, the passion, the, 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 the getting into the emotional side of vehicles, which I think honestly most people – are driven by emotions when they go buy a vehicle even with trucks you know they say well you know i need a truck i, I live a truck and, and you you described very well what life is like in nebraska and that's in this part of the united states where trucks aren't just kind of a fad they're they're a way of life mm -hmm. but you don't just want any truck you want you might want that top of the line ram or you might go for reliability and, and go for a tundra or something like that but 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 there's what colors are they? What kind of options can you get used to heated seats in the cold days of Nebraska, don't you? I mean, I, so, so you, that, that's, part, that's part of it. And, and I think that's, that's, a, that's an area. I mean, I always thought that Consumer Reports did the hard part. We got credibility as testers. Now should be the fun part. This is when we kind of get to go off and, and talk about how much, we, how much a car really moves us. And, and we actually we have our own podcast, the Talking Cars podcast where we really get to espouse more of, of that kind of, of passion or you know, extreme dislike of a car. I think we're, we're lucky to be able to do that as well because, as you know, some mainstream journalists, they're going to be very careful about criticizing a car. And I, and I think that we try to do that respectfully, uh, within reason, uh, but we are allowed to say, you know, this car just didn't do it for me. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I'd keep my mouth shut more often because I sometimes get in trouble for, for spouting off too much about a bad car. Um, I don't hold back. Uh, so so let's so you have a test track. You have a truck. So you're going to take it on the test track and do some handling and, and ride comfort and things. But I've always been curious about like towing and hauling and that kind of stuff. Do you have like – do you do that kind of scientific testing with the trucks in that realm? We don't do instrumented testing for uh, – with, with a load full – or with a with a with a with a maxed out trailer, I think honestly because it's so variable. So yeah. some people are going to have a lot of stuff in the bed. Some people will have a little stuff in their bed. Some people might have a small trailer. Some people have a trailer might have a trailer with with two axles. Uh, so I don't think there's any kind of universal way to test it in in terms of of making uh, like a ratings an actual number. Uh, but what we can't what we do do is we do load up the trucks. We do pull trailers. And we do talk about it in the in the story. Uh, we we also have a, a Rock Hill, which is if if you look at some Consumer Reports videos where you we see some of the the tougher off road vehicles. We always we have we've got like 90 tons of boulders cemented into a very steep hill on our test track. Uh, this was designed by my old boss, a guy named David Champion, who before he worked at Consumer Reports worked for Land Rover. So he had knew a thing or two about off-roading. Okay. See, the thing about, about doing any kind of evaluations off-road is that when you're in a two-track, you're in dirt, you know, the first two or three times down the same path, the traction is, is one way. But after about 30 or 40 passes, the, the traction is completely different. So one of the things that we mandate here at Consumer Reports is that the the test um, the, the, the test uh, uh, conditions have to be consistent? So I mean that you can't keep dirt consistent from one truck to another. 
So that's one of the reasons why we used stone and concrete to, to build the wall, because that surface isn't going to change with, with more and more vehicles going up and going up it. But the thing is, most people don't do really hardcore off-roading. If you, if, you, you know, if you buy a Ford Explorer, it isn't really a tough off-road vehicle, say, like a Toyota 4Runner. And so we're, we're, we, will, we will take every vehicle that has decent ground clearance and low-range gearing up the Rock Hill, but we're not going to evaluate it because we don't think it is a real-world evaluation if most people – so, so in other words, we're not going to nail a vehicle for maybe not being great off-road if hardly anyone takes it off-road. Does that make sense? Are you saying that more Ford Raptor owners are parking at Walmart than they are parking Rubicon Trail? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've, I've driven I've driven a Raptor, especially at the Texas truck rodeos that you and I attend. That's some truck. Right. Yeah. I, I are you guys surprised? I, I, so so I, I know the evaluation. Then you I should wrap this up. So you guys evaluate it, you test it, you do our instrument testing, you talk about it, you talk to passion in the cars podcast, then you sell these vehicles and you're done, right? Yes, actually, that's the number one question I get asked is what do you do with the vehicles when you're done testing them? And between the, 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 the test track here in Connecticut and we have satellite offices in, 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 in Washington, D.C., in San Francisco, and, um, and then the home office in, in New York, there's probably about 500 people all collectively that work for Consumer Reports. And so when we're done testing them, we also save the vehicles for about six months in case manufacturer wants to do a follow-up. So we, we have the vehicle on hand just in case we have to you know, look at it or for whatever. But in most cases, it's fine. Uh, so we put them up for sale for the people that work for Consumer Reports. And usually we find someone within that pool of about 500 people that want to buy it. And if we can't find a, a buyer, we'll often um, trade it in on another test vehicle. Um, or sometimes we'll get a, a wholesaler come in and, and, and bring a, a car carry and buy a whole bunch of them at sure. once. Um, the, the vehicles are, are well treated. When we go to sell them, if they need brake pads, we put on brake pads. If they need tires, we put on tires. My wife drives an ex-test car, and as as you know, I, I, it's a nonprofit organization, which means, well, you know, I don't have a big Wall Street bonus coming in, so we're we're very frugal in our household. <laughs> My wife's Camry is a 2002 that is an ex-test vehicle. Well, you know, the Onion ran that story about they're going to call those Camrys because about time you should have bought something new by now. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it's it's it has stability control and head curtain airbags, which at the time was kind of a big deal. But no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Listen, it doesn't have forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking. Uh, that's that's kind of the double edged sword. And I'm sure you get this question all the time in terms of dollar for dollar. What's the best way to 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 stretch your automotive budget is you buy a car that's reliable. You drive it for a long, long, long time to amortize the, the cost of your, your transportation. Now, that, that's a good way to save money, but you also wind up driving a vehicle that has really old technology. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, I deal with that a lot. You know, I, My customer or my viewers are really come down to two groups. One group of them are really into reliability. Like that's their main focus. They don't care about bells and whistles. It's all about reliability. The other group is like, holy cow, I want that, right? It's the Disneyland people like, oh, I got to buy that feature because as you guys have found and, and you guys know, trucks are changing so quickly. I would argue they're the fastest changing segment among automotive groups as far as segments going on because there's so many new changes, new trucks, the whole off-roading trucks are huge. The off-road packaging is becoming much more extensive than it ever used to be. And the variety now, like you can get an F-150 anywhere from like 28,000 or so up to 70,000 and they are that's, completely different trucks. Nuts. Yeah. No, and 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 to, and and, to, and the other side of the coin is yes, the truck uh, popularity as you know, I mean, I don't have to tell you how popular trucks are, but it's also kind of where the money is. Yeah. I mean, if you're a manufacturer, you're making most of your profit margins on pickup trucks and SUVs. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, that's one of the reasons that gets pushed is that's how they make a lot of money too. Now you talk about that manufacturers and I know we've talked about this too. So um, I guess alluded to this a little bit. I do press trips where I fly someplace, talk to engineers, marketing people are there and, and I evaluate the vehicle with them and get interviews and such. But in your case, you guys don't do those kind of trips and you have the manufacturers come to you. So when they do that, do they set up like shop in like your shop and like do a presentation of things or do they meet you with you in a boardroom? How does that kind of look, work? Well, at, at, at our test track, uh, 
it's 327 acres, so we've got some room not only to do the, the instrumented testing, but we also have a lot of office space. And yes, you're right. We have a couple conference rooms on site where we can sit down with the manufacturers. We have a screen if they want to do a PowerPoint or some kind of, uh, of a demonstration about their vehicle. That's available. Uh, we allow the manufacturers to come into our garage space and bring in their new car. We do a walk around and they explain what they did and why they did it. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually really helpful because as we're learning about their vehicle, inevitably there's someone on the manufacturer side that's never been to our track before. Mm -hmm. And so we give them a tour. We show them around. You know, this is our straightaway. This is our skid pad. This is where we do our avoidance maneuver. This is our braking area. This is our handling circuit. There's a, this is the Rock Hill. Um, because we, we want people to understand how – uh, hardcore isn't the word, but we're really serious about our testing and, and to see the facilities firsthand. I mean, instead of, you know, getting dismissed like, oh, consumer reports, they don't, they know, they don't know. They, they're testing toasters one minute. And, no, we're, we're here at the track. We're doing vehicles. We're doing tires. We're doing child safety seats. That's it. Yeah. So when people say, oh, you work for consumer reports, I need a new microwave oven. I'll like, I have no idea. <laughs> Here's the website. I know about cars. Uh, that's it. but so so I mean I sorry for the long answer, but but it's like manufacturers come here and they see for themselves. So maybe some of the cynicism goes away. We've also had a bunch of journalists that that didn't really trust us or said, "Oh, you know, you're in bed with the Japanese or you're biased and blah blah blah." And we've invited them to the track, we've showed them around, we've given them a tour. And they go away singing a different tune. Right. You know, I mean, it, it, it's it, you're you're evaluating vehicles, and so you you might get the wrath of somebody if you don't necessarily love what they love, and and you have to find ways of dealing with it. And 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 the way that we try to deal with it is is let us show you. Yeah, yeah, I know. If I ever make it to the Northeast, which is one part of the country I just cannot get to. I don't know why. I can get to New York City. That's about as far northeast as I can get to. But I'm going to stop by if I. That's a a, a, a warning, a threat, whatever. Um, I'm going to stop by. We're about two hours from New York. About two hours from Boston. I know. I just I, I I don't know why I cannot make it that part of the country. It's just one of those parts. But I got one final question before we wrap this up. Um, I'm curious since you know you are evaluating cars and you're you have your and I have one. <clears throat> you have the magazine, which this was like. Fifteen bucks at the airport or something. There's an, what the heck? Living for pizzas, Tim. It's nonprofit. We gotta make some money to fund our testing. <laughs> I'm gonna use it on all my videos so I can write the damn thing off. So I can write it off. But I, I'm I'm just curious because I know you and I talk online and and you see stuff online. But how much do you guys pay attention to the rest of the automotive segment? You know, as far as how we pay attention to what you're doing. Are you reading Car and Driver? Are you reading Autoblog? Are you looking at all news? Are you, are you paying attention to what's going on? Oh, yeah. We're, we're total automotive junkies. And, and we read I, – I, I mean I, I grew up reading all the magazines uh, every month very religiously. We have a subscription here uh, at, at the track where we actually do have paper copies. But, but no, we're all seeing stuff online. We're all going on different forums. Uh, when we started uh, testing Teslas, for example, I mean that's a, that's a world unto itself uh, and, and, and the fanaticism that, that goes along with Teslas. Um, but no, we, we definitely are, are reading and keeping up with what's going on, not only what, what journalists are kind of buzzing about, but where the industry is going, where the safety gr groups are going. Uh, you know, what, what is the latest with, with, with driverless technology? Uh, driver assistance systems, what's going on with safety, what's going on with the fuel economy. So we really have our hands on the pulse of all things automotive, and which you know makes this a great place to work when you're a car geek like me. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Well, hey, thanks for the conversation today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm glad we finally got this done because we've been talking about it for years. I know. It's been our list. Thanks, thanks for the uh, slowdown in the world right now. We've made it happen. <laughs> So there you go. There was my interview with Mike Quincy with Consumer Reports. I want to thank him for being on the channel. He's a good friend of mine, and I really appreciate his time. It's really interesting for me and maybe for you to get other journalists' viewpoints on things and kind of see the differences in how we all work. So I thought that was kind of valuable to the audience. If you have further questions, Consumer Reports, let me know. We can do some follow-up interviews as well. And remember, for more Pickup Truck Plus SUV news, find us on PickupTruckTalk.com. Those three words work again on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Type it in. Trust me, we're there. I've done it. 
As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you down the road.